among people who had forgotten the path of their forefather Abraham. They worshipped idols, killed their infant daughters, treated women as property, carried tribal vendettas for generations, and were corrupt to an extreme. The Prophet Muhammad was a person who was very sensitive, and he had tremendous emotional sensibilities. It was very healthy, and he couldn't stand the ethics and the morals of, of Mecca of his day, of his, of his tribe, of, of the Arabs of his time. And he frequently would have to leave it to make sense. Muhammad would frequently get away from Mecca and meditate in the surrounding deserts and mountains. At the age of 40, while engaged in a meditative retreat atop a mountain near Mecca, Muhammad was called to his mission. Muhammad was called to prophethood. One night in the ninth lunar month of the Muslim calendar, he received revelation from an angel that he was completely, that completely startled him. He wasn't expecting it. He didn't seek it. He, he in fact, tried to reject it. He was, he was worried about it. When the prophet was in the cave, he heard a voice that told him in Arabic, Iqra, which basically means to read or recite. And the prophet, who was unlettered at the time, who was unable to, to read or write, told this voice, this presence, I don't know how. And this presence squeezed him to the point where he almost collapsed. The prophet then knew he wasn't dreaming because he was stunned by this physical presence. It wasn't just a voice. And again, the command was repeated, Iqra, read. And he repeated again, I don't know how, I'm not a reader. And then again, this presence, who was the angel Gabriel as we now know, embraced him again to the point where he almost collapsed. And he was told, Iqra, read. And he said, I, I am not a reader. And then more came. It was read in the name of your Lord who created. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Created the human from clinging cells. Read, and your Lord is most bountiful. The one who taught with the pen, taught the human what he did not know. These five verses were the first revelation that God sent to Muhammad through the Archangel Gabriel. This revelation, which continued for 23 years, is known as the Quran. Before oil and before Islam, the only resource of the Arabs was Arabic. And it is a language that is almost mathematical in its grammar, but in its yield, it's very sublime and subtle. And the Arabs were great poets and they were masters of language, it was their sole science. When the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, it was revealed in Arabic. They were so stunned by its beauty because they have a developed sense of appreciation. And the irony is, because it was so beautiful, for those who didn't want to accept it, they, they were so threatened by it. But clearly no one, not even the most vehement opponents of the Prophet ever thought that this was less than sublime, less than absolutely beautiful language. Even the most, the ones who tried to assassinate the prophet, many times, admitted that this book is amazing. This book is not from this world. Muslims believe that the Quran is the complete and unchanged word of God. It is the principal source of every Muslim's faith and practice. It is not only recited in the five daily prayers, but is also a practical guide to life, dealing with issues ranging from birth to death and everything in between. Muhammad shared the Quran, God's message, with his people. With the exception of a few, most of the people of Mecca rejected his call to worship one God. Muhammad and his followers became the subjects of bitter persecution.
In 622, God gave the Muslim community the command to migrate to the city of Medina. Here, under the Prophet's inspired leadership, a model Muslim community evolved. A community that gave women equal rights to that of men. A community that removed race, language, and culture barriers, where a person's status was not determined by the color of their skin, their gender, or their wealth, but rather by the quality of their character. At the time of the Prophet's death in 632, the Muslim community had grown exponentially, and the whole of Arabia, including the people of Mecca, had accepted Islam. The Muslim community continued to grow after Prophet Muhammad's death. Within a few decades, vast numbers of people across three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, had chosen Islam as their way of life. One of the reasons for the rapid and peaceful spread of Islam was the purity of its doctrine. Islam calls for faith in only one God. This, coupled with the Islamic concepts of equality, justice, and freedom, resulted in a united and peaceful community. People were free to travel from Spain to China without fear and without crossing any borders. Islamic civilization grew up right next door to European Christian civilization. Islam was not exotic. Islam was not foreign. Islam was not difficult to understand. Islam for Christian Europe in the Middle Ages was extremely close, physically and ideologically. Islamic civilization gave it the stained glass windows of our churches and synagogues. A lot of the vegetables and fruit that we eat, tea and coffee, sugar, a lot of the medicine, astronomy, philosophy, mathematics, algebra, algorithms and optics. The exchange was a profound exchange and the Muslim world fertilized the Christian world. By the 8th and 9th centuries, most of the then known world came under Islamic influence, whether directly under Muslim rule or indirectly through the preservation, development and dissemination of knowledge. Great institutions of learning, universities, sprung up in all parts of the Muslim empire. Cordoba in Spain, Al-Azhar in Egypt, and Timbuktu in West Africa became the equivalent of Harvard, Oxford, and Cambridge of today. Because of the freedom and respect accorded by Islam to all ideas and ideologies, great advances in art, architecture, astronomy, geography, history, language, literature, mathematics, medicine, and physics were made. Jews, Christians, Muslims, and people of all faiths participated in this explosion of knowledge. The 800-year Ottoman reign is one of the most important dynasties in human history. And it was an Islamic dynasty. And it had a massive impact on Europe. Andalusia, the Spanish Muslim experience, was in a very important uh, watershed for Europe and the Renaissance. Same is true of Italy and Sicily and the Islamic influence. So the debts that Western people owe the Muslim world and the Muslim scientists, the Muslim cultural savants, all of the great gifts that Islam has given the West. It is particularly noteworthy that non-Muslims living under Muslim rule were for the most part accorded privileged status and were protected right from the time of Muhammad through to the modern era. In Muslim Spain, Muslim Portugal, Muslim Sicily, Muslims were in Switzerland for 100 years. Wherever they went, in Anatolia, among Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, they were very successful. When people got to know them, people tended to like them. They tended to be attracted to them. It is only in the modern times, and that even, in the last few decades, 
that one sees intolerance, sexism, and extremism manifest itself in parts of the Muslim world. In the modern age, Muslims were disempowered. In the 19th century in particular, almost all parts of the Muslim world came under direct colonial rule. Even those that didn't come under colonial rule came under indirect colonial control, especially through banks, so that the Muslims lost their freedom. And in that process, we also see something very remarkable, and that is the sharp deterioration of the status of women. Women's rights, guaranteed by the Quran and by the example of Prophet Muhammad, have been replaced by chauvinist, anti-Islamic ideas in some Muslim communities around the world. Terrorism, as a violent manifestation of extremism, is frequently associated with Muslims today. Yet this evil ideology is completely against the letter and spirit of Islam. The Quran states unequivocally that whosoever kills someone is as though he has killed all of humanity and whosoever saves a life is as though he has saved all of humanity. Muslims are by the very nature of Islam itself against terrorism because Islam means uh, finding peace through submission to the will of Allah. So therefore, terrorism, uh, trying to intimidate people in order to get your point across or, or, or to take over their land uh, or to drive them away, um, this very act is totally against uh, Islam and uh, within Islamic law and lifestyle, uh, terrorism is completely forbidden. Terrorism, holy war, suicide bombings, these have no place in Islam. The term holy war is not to be found anywhere in the Quran or in the life of the Prophet Muhammad and certainly nowhere in classical Islamic teachings. The vast majority of Muslims abhor violence and feel that their peaceful faith has been hijacked by the few extremely fanatical who are abusing Islam for their personal and political gains. One of the problems in the Muslim world today is a cultural breakdown. The traditional cultures, which were very beautiful and generally extremely effective, they've broken down. And that's why it's very important also to see that a culture is created in the Muslim world that is worthy of the past. I think in focusing on the positive aspects of Islam and the positive aspects of the West on both sides of the fence, will be the most important factor in tearing that fence down so that we can actually live as neighbors, not in fear of each other, but in mutual respect. So I think it's time that now we're, we're in this part of the 21st century and we have the capability of destroying ourselves and the whole planet, that we need to reach out to each other to combat ignorance, to, to take off the veils of, of, of misunderstanding and to join hands as a human race uh, to save this planet and to make it a place uh, for our children to dwell in uh, into the future. Ultimately, it is the responsibility of Muslims worldwide to reach out and take back the peaceful and progressive message of Islam. And it is the responsibility of both Muslims and non-Muslims to learn from one another to dialogue and engage one another in a meaningful way and to work with one another towards salam, towards peace.